Hello, I'm Alice Hutchinson, the owner of Bird's Books, an independent bookstore in Bethel, Connecticut, and I'm honored to be the host of Write America. The aim of this series is to help set the country back on a correct, productive course of freedom, justice, equality, and plain human kindness. Write America is a literary series created by author Ro Roger Rosenblatt, featuring award-winning, nationally renowned authors and, a new and emerging writers in reading and conversation each week about how books and art might bridge the deep divisions in our nation. Roger Rosenblatt, the esteemed writer and creator of Write America, puts it this way, writing makes justice desirable, evil intelligible, grief endurable, and love possible. So welcome, and please join us every Monday evening at this time as many of the most beloved and distinguished writers in the country read from their works and talk to each other, and with you, in an effort to bring us together. Tonight, Bird's Books hosts a special edition of Write America with a reading by and conversation with Paul Harding and Subhashini Kalagotla. I will return afterward to bring your questions and comments to the authors. For those of you unfamiliar with Crowdcast, I want to mention that there is a chat to the right of your screen. Feel free to make comment at any time. But if you have a question, at the bottom of your screen is an ask a question tab. That's where you ask a question that I go to to ask the authors. And the third thing is the purchase of the author's books from Bird's Books is a button at the bottom of your page. Don't forget that they have written wonderful works and deserve to be supported. Now, a little bit more about our first speaker. Paul Harding is the author of two novels about multiple generations of New England family, Enon and the Pulitzer Prize winning Tinkers. He teaches at Stony Brook, Southampton. Please welcome to the screen, Paul Harding. As soon as I can find him. Paul, where are you? Excuse me, folks, I seem to be having a bit of a difficulty. Paul, sign back in, please. There you go. Sorry about that. Lost you for a minute there, and now you're back. Nothing like starting off with a little technolo technological glitch. Um, <laughs> thanks. Thanks, Alice, and um, thanks to you for um, picking up the series um, and, and carrying you, you and Bird's books for picking up the series and carrying it forward. I think it's a really incredible series. Um, and um, uh, I, I, the, the readings um, in the series have just been incredible. And this is my second one, and it's a real privilege and honor to be a part of them. Um, and thanks, of course, to Roger Rosenblatt, who, um, Brought all, brings all, all of us together every week um, for these these um, these uh, episodes of um, sanity and civilization, um, and it's a great great pleasure um, to be uh, reading with um, Subhashini tonight. So um, I'm going to read um, a couple of relatively brief um, passages: one from my uh, first novel, Tinkers, and then another brief uh, page or two from uh, my second novel, Enon. I was going to read to you from my third novel that will be out next fall, I think. Um, but um, as is so often the case, um, we're not on speaking terms at the moment. So <laughs> we, couldn't, we couldn't come to an agreement. So this first piece is, um, uh, both of the pieces that I've, I've uh, uh, decided to read um, also are um, in part inspired by um, having spent time over the last week with um, Subhashi's poetry. And I think there's some resonance between them. Um, so both of these people, both of, the, both of these readings are about um, about uh, people who have been lost to the to the narrator, um, and um, and how um, we are haunted by those who have disappeared almost to the extent and to the to to the resolution where their absences are almost as precise as their presences were, um, and so the hauntings are almost like invocations as well. So um, and the the first. One from uh, from Tinker's is also um, this is this is for Roger in particular because he and I have talked about this passage before. This is a, a, um, a character um, in Tinker's who's just um, remembering his father um, who um, faded from his life and from his self um, kind of unnamed mental illness. So this is just the character's description of of losing his losing his father. So 
It seemed to me as if my father simply faded away. He became more and more difficult to see. One day, I thought he was sitting in his chair at his desk writing. To all appearances, he scribbled at a sheet of paper. When I asked him where the bag for apple picking was, he disappeared. I could not tell whether he had been there in the first place or if I had asked my question to some lingering after image. He leaked out of the world gradually though. At first, he seemed merely vague or peripheral, but then he could no longer furnish the proper frame for his clothes. He would ask me a question from behind the box on which I sat shelling peas or peeling potatoes for my mother. And when I answered and received no reply back, I would turn around to find his hat or belt or a single shoe sitting in the door frame as if placed there by a mischievous child. The end came when we could no longer even see him, but felt him in brief disturbances of shadows or light or as a slight pressure, as if the space one occupied suddenly had had something more packed into it, or we'd catch some faint scent out of season, such as the snow melting into the wool of his winter coat, but on a blistering August noon as if the last few times I felt him as another being rather than as a recollection. He had thought to check up on this world at the wrong moment and accidentally stepped from whatever wintry place he was straight into the dog days. And it seems that doing so only confirmed to him his fate to fade away, his being in the wrong place, so that during these startled visits, although I could not see him, I could feel his surprise, the, his bafflement, the display, the, the, excuse me, the dismay felt in a dream when you suddenly meet the brother you forgot you had or remember the infant you left on the hillside miles away hours ago because somehow you were distracted and somehow you came to believe in a different life. And your shock at these terrible recollections, these sudden reunions, comes as much from your sorrow at what you have neglected as it does from dismay at how thoroughly and quickly you, you came to believe in something else. The world fell away from my father the way he fell away from us. We became his dream. Another time I found him fumbling for an apple in the barrel we kept in the basement. I could just make him out in the gloom. Each time he tried to grab a piece of fruit, it eluded him, or I might say he eluded it as his grasp was no stronger than a draft of air threading through a crack in the window. He succeeded once after appearing to concentrate for a moment in upsetting an apple from its place at the top of the pile, but it merely tumbled down the other apples and came to rest against the, barrel, the mouth of the barrel. It seemed to me that even if I could pick an apple up with my failing hands, how could I bite it with my dissipating teeth, digest it with my ethereal gut? I realized that this thought was not my own, but rather my father's, that even his ideas were leaking out of his former self. Hands, teeth, gut, thoughts even, were all simply more or less convenient to human circumstance. And as my, and as my father was receding from human circumstance, so too were all of these particulars, back into some unknowable froth where they might be reassigned to be stars or belt buckles, lunar dust or railroad spikes. Perhaps they already were all of these things. And my father's fading was because he realized this, my goodness, I am made from planets and wood, diamonds and orange peels, now and then, here and there. The iron in my blood was once the blade of a Roman plow, Peel back my scalp and you will see my cranium covered in the scrimshaw carved by an ancient sailor who never suspected that he was whittling at my skull. No, my blood is a Roman plow. My bones are being etched by men with names that mean sea wrestler and ocean rider. And the pictures they are making are pictures of Northern stars at different seasons. And the man keeping my blood straight as it splits the soil is named Lucian, and he will plant wheat, and I cannot concentrate on this apple. And the only thing common to all of this is that I feel sorrow so deep it must be love. And they are upset because while they are carving and plowing, they are troubled by visions of trying to pick apples from barrels. I looked away and ran back upstairs, 
skipping the ones that creaked so that I would not embarrass my father, who had not yet quite turned back from clay into light. So there's a little bit of tinkers there. Um, and I'll finish with just reading a page and a half or so from uh, my second novel, Enon, um, which is about a father who um, uh, loses his uh, only child, a daughter, when she's a teenager. Um, and one of the things that he does is he, he takes up um, skulking around the town at night and often ends up in the, in, the, um, in the graveyard, in the cemetery where she's buried very late at night, sort of up on the top, top of a hill looking down on where she, where she, where she is. Um, and so one of the things he does is he takes her memory and sort of repatriates her into the town's past. And so this is a, um, uh, it becomes increasingly um, uh, uh, dark and bad for him to be doing this. So this is just one of the versions of her that that he um, that he imagines. Um, I don't think you need to know any, anything about that. This is just um, um, the cemetery is next to a golf course. I think that might come up. You know, the obsidian girl moves through the trees at night. She moves across the fairway of the golf course near the road. She is all but invisible, the girl of black glass, appearing only as a wobbly blur. She is a dark lens. Through her, the dark underpinnings of the world are visible, but they turn whoever might see them to stone or to ice or to salt or to marsh grass. Every night just before dawn, she climbs down into the hill through a hidden trap door. She sounds like a crystal decanter rolling along the granite seams that lead down to the heart of the hill, where a furnace burns all day and all night, and dark, vague men shovel coal into its white-hot mouth. When the girl made of black glass appears, the men lean their shovels against the walls of the chamber and retreat into the shadows. The girl steps in front of the furnace, and the heat roars out and over her like a shimmering hurricane. She tilts her head back and holds her hands out at her sides. The heat blasts at her and the tips of her fingers begin to glow. The outlines of her face and arms and legs began to buckle and kink. Her legs give at the knees and the rest of her slides off them and drops in front of them. She remains upright for a moment, but then she topples face first onto the dirt floor in front of the open furnace. It appears as if she is sinking into the dirt at first, but she is actually melting. The glass held the shape of a girl only while it was cool, but now it is molten and pools over the floor. There is no way to tell if the glass leaks out of the girl or if the girl leaks out of the glass. There is a sound that no human ear can hear coming from a place no human eye can see from deeper within the earth, but also from deep in the sky and the water and inside the trees and inside the rocks. The sound is a voice coming from deep inside the throat of the world. The sound is a note from a register so low that it cannot be heard, but many people throughout the town are disturbed from their sleep by it. The note is a part of great vaulted cathedrals of chords that keep the universe speeding out from its own genesis. It is sensate, and down in the chamber of the hill, it sounds both like weeping and like laughter, and both are at the grief of the glass girl who throws herself in front of the fires every morning just before dawn, and who, to her unending despair, is remade every evening in a deeper foundry and evicted from the depths of the hill back to the surface where the cool air flowing through the grass cools and sets her glass eyes and her glass brow, her glass brains and her glass heart. And she begins uh, another night as the brittle memories of a man who is the father of a girl she never was. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. We'll bring you back on the other side. Now, we have Subhashini Kalagotla, a poet and art historian of pre-modern South Asia, author of poetry of a poetry collection, Bird 
of the Indian subcontinent in 2018. She teaches at Yale and lives in New York City. And I need to bring her in from the attendees because somehow she got bumped out. And so we're going to invite her onto the screen. There you are. Yes, hi, can hi. you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, all right. Um, well, first of all, I, I have to say how moved I was by Paul's reading, um, the vividness of, of the imagery um, and yeah, the resonances with, um, with some of what I've been thinking about and writing about as well. I also want to say thank you to Alice. Um, thank you for hosting Ride America and tonight's event. A special thank you to Roger Rosenblatt for organizing this terrific series that has brought so many of us together uh, every Monday night. And thanks to all of you for joining us this evening. I am really honored to be part of this series and honored to be reading with Paul. I'm going to start by reading a poem from my first poetry collection, Bird of the Indian Subcontinent, and then I'll read mostly new work from my second as yet unpublished book. So the poems in Bird deal with the aftermath of love and relationships, and the poems in the new collection are looking at love in the face of death, so love in the aftermath of death, and I really loved that uh, line from um, Paul, sorrow so deep, it must be love. So um, anyway, here goes. So the first poem is from Bird. How sly the heart. Send an innocuous little text, she whispered. Make it short and flirty. No strings, no needs, no plangency just a thinking of you in Hyderabad sort of thing. I was tempted, sitting across from mother, cut off from male company, except for the telephone men who wander through the house in their hapless way, while we, mother and I, devour hundreds of pages with our tea, swallow fistfuls of warm air with our bread, and watch honey eaters sting the red throats of the hibiscus. This is the best time. Flocks of birds pass overhead. The heat subsides. Now is the best time. Scrawny-necked cormorants move in large crowds with quick wing beats. Egrets are slow and stately, intimate in groups of twos and threes. And the parakeets race like teenage boys. But before you can find their sound, a noise between harsh and kind, they've gone. If equanimity should find me, it'll find me in this place at this hour between six and seven when the wanting stops and I'm happy to sit and watch and have exactly what's laid out for me. Requiem. What remains of you, beloved, to haunt self, like the tangled script of an ancient king speaking across time, memory scars cascading over red rock, addressing arid, unpeopled land, body terrain riven, overlaid with later scripts, later battles fought in later tongues. Like the king who expresses remorse, for the battle in which he destroyed and deported and severed hundreds and thousands from the beloved. Like the king who inscribes his sorrow, not in the place he has scarred, that is, not in Kalinga. Self, too, writes her sorrow elsewhere. Anecdote of his vanity. Sometimes he worried about losing his hair. After all, he was blessed with movie star looks, even if he thought he had lost them. Dark brown hair, though thinner than his boy band beauty days, shone against luminous skin. In his cheeks, dimples glowed 
when he smiled with that natural, enviable charm. These gifts did not mean I worried less about leaving him with the night nurses when the building grew quiet and the doctors came less often. We joked about his belly roll, thinking it gave him an advantage. Cheeks sucked in, head in three-quarter profile, he performed the thinner, dapper, post-treatment self he would surely be. And his favorite choice of headgear? A tweed newsboy cap. The incident of his abduction. Before things got irredeemably bad, and they did very soon, very fast, and after the initial panic, we were given one evening. I let him talk about a building in the skyline of the city he called a celebrity. On that night of stillness, we were two people who made the world. On that night of stillness, we two people were the world. That I can't remember which building or what he said is only one erasure. What can memory safeguard? What words can keep the life snatched up by the night stalker who rose up growing 10 heads and 20 arms and a thick unruly neck, who was granted the boon of invincibility, who couldn't be defeated by the gods or the lords of the gods, who was unmoved by prayer, immune to spells, whose weapons were fevers and floods, fevers for the blood and a deluge for the lungs, in whose presence all beings wailed, upon whose approach all beings quivered, who snatched my beloved, my world, and fled. No more. Soon after, mere seconds after, he became the body. No more of the present continuous with the name his parents had given or our most recent endearment that had stuck. No more possessed of a future far off or immediate. No more sovereign but the body. As in please take as much time as you need with the body. Then they would move the body. What did you do with the body? Had I seen the body again? Where was the body? How did the body look? We never got to see the body. They would bring the body. There was no need to embalm the body. How do you want to dress the body? What kind of arrangements had I made for the body? Not wanting, not wanting to lose even this time, this last time with the small quirks of his body, I circled and I talked with no sense of how much time I was with Caleb. Memorial. At first, he was more alive than the living because so many people wanted to talk. So many people wanted to be near me, to be near him. People came out of the woods, friends, colleagues, former lovers, and even strangers because he was young and his death quick and sure, let's use the word tragic. They showed me pictures I never saw before, pictures made of words and pictures made of images. It's as if through the power of those words, he could be conjured, younger, funnier, kinder, more talented, more charismatic, more accomplished. I talked and they talked, and if we talked long enough, he might even materialize. Caleb might just walk through the doors, appear. Grammar lessons. Transition to past participle complete. Disparu, disappeared, dead. Why not call it lifeless, present? One instant he is warm and healthy in the pitch, ready to kick a football with his friends. Then asystole, speeding pointlessly to the unknown doctor who will call time of death. Let the conditional begin its word magic speak for the no longer able, premised as it is on their somehow existing in two states at once, expressing their views through our mouthpieces, double agents playing for both teams. And so the chorus, he wouldn't want to live like that. He wouldn't want to live. He wouldn't want to live like that. Who wouldn't want to live?
pen work. That sound is air gusting from the electric fan. Who knew that the world could so empty, that the widowed days would need application like dye and design on a penwork cloth. No mordant and the color won't bite. No resist and the indigo bath promises to engulf the pattern. The wise man does not indulge in grief for all creatures are cooked by time. Days begin expectant, bleach cotton primed for the maker's hand, a controlled press of ink arranging the hours like episodes from the old stories in which a blue god shoots his arrows on a red battlefield, his life story filling the wall-wide cloth. Who knew that even a god must die and worse, be divided from brothers and beloved? Who knew that he would refuse heaven because that heaven was no heaven, but more longing for those he loved? That sound is air gusting. Those who truly are wise mourn. I'm just going to close with a very short poem called Apothecary. I sleep with you and I wake with you. I distill my days into apothecary bottles that would fill your faraway place with the cicadas that burn so ardently in my humid air. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Zabash. It was incredible. Um, I feel like I've got a million questions I'd like to ask you. <laughs> well, I think I think I have a million questions for you too. Um, where do we begin? Well, I, one of the things that I was um, the line from the I think the second to last poem you read: the, "All creatures are cooked by time." One of the yeah. things that I was noticing, um, reading some of your other poems, I was thinking of a, a poem called. Lepidoptera and um, uh, self-portrait as Caravaggio, where you have these lines, uh, you know, the body is a dead end, um, the, uh, the body's ability, uh, the body has an inability to hold anything it loves. So this idea of, and the poem, I think previous, third last poem, the, 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 with the refrain, the body, the body, the body. And so this idea of mortality and where does the life go, you know? Um, and just thinking, because I've had similar passages in my own, where, where when does a, a body, you know, when does he or she or they become it? And where does that go, you know? Yeah, yeah. I, and I, I, you know, speaking of the body, that that was something that I was so moved by. Uh, and uh, in your work, uh, you know, he leaked out of the world. Like those, um, and, and the way in which you really locate us in, the body of these protagonists, you know, like in Tinkers with um, this man. I mean, you open with this man who's kind of hallucinating and, um, you know, we're in this body of the dying person. But, but yeah, like it's only after you lose somebody who is in a sense a part of your body uh, and there isn't a kind of separation between your body and their body that, that you realize that you cannot speak about these people you cannot objectify them in the way that, as the world does, right? So, of course, to everybody else, they, they somehow immediately transition into the past tense. You know, yeah. suddenly people are saying things like, I loved, you know, who... So it's right. not as if the love goes away because, you know, in, this person in, as a material thing disappears. So, so it's only when I was confronted with the death of, people yeah who are a part of my body that i realize no they're still you know i still right. want to use the present tense for these people and um you know they're not kind of material things right right and yeah. it's a kind of that metaphysical kind of co co the sense of coextensivity sort of um uh of time as well as place you know the the idea that um if you lose if you lose your father, you're still his son. Yeah, he's still he's still your father. That's it's just right. Exactly, exactly. If you lose your brother, which I have, um, mm -hmm. you know, he's still my brother, 
and Man. I still have a brother, you know, but right. then somehow, you know, our language. Yeah, I, I think so much of what I was, tr what I've been trying to do in the second book is even kind of, uh, you know, like expose what we do with language uh, right. and how, um, the, yeah, there are all of these like major inadequacies with the language that we use. Mm -hmm. The, yeah. the language that we deploy. Yeah, I find myself always obsessed with verb tenses. Absolutely, <laughs> yeah. yes, yes, yeah, yes. Yeah, because it's, it's, it's yeah. not very simple as in the past. It's, it's, um, because it's, it, language is incantatory. It invokes, it invokes a, 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 a reading of the, um, the, the uh, I just want to make sure I get the, I just, yeah, no more. The poem, no more. That again, the re refrain of the body, the body, the body. Yeah, it just put me in mind of I can't remember the, the name of the essay, but so, something by William James, who he's talking about. Um, because I, I think about phenomenology a lot and, uh, when I <laughs> read your poems, you know, that experiential quality. And yeah, and William James talking somewhere about, um, about the fact that there is there is no such thing as absence, as generalized absence. The absence is always of a thing in, or person in particular, so that their absence is unique and as resolved and as complicated as their presence was. You know, an absence yeah, always yeah. precisely describes the pre of the pre what was the presence. Right, and I mean, I'm going to say something more banal than what you've said, but but it's not as if the the relationship terminates with the end of the physical body you know that right. continues um and so so i don't know and so in a sense there's a coexistence maybe of the absence and the presence and right. and there are ways in which we conjure these people right and, and of course the psychologists love to talk about um you know how the dead the dead are integrated by the living and so you know uh, so in a sense, you can conjure these people mm -hmm. uh, through memory and through writing and so on. Yeah, um, yeah absolutely. Yeah. And, and I don't know, for my part, too, um, the, the people um, with whom I was, well, was going to say closest, but some the people with whom I was not terribly close yeah. or of, of, of whom I was not terribly fond, I dream about them all the time. And, and oh, it's just, I envy you that then. So is that well, something... Is that oh, something that happens fairly regularly? Yeah, all the time, all the time. And in the in the dreams, they they are dead, and I'm talking to them in the present. <laughs> it's just the strangest strangest thing in the world. And as dreams do, they feel autonomous, um, and so it's just a very you know I I feel the presence of those people just regularly still. It's, it's very you know. And and so then do the. So then do they make it into your writing somehow? And and it sounds like you are aware in these dreams that they are dead. Like there isn't this uh, disconnect yeah. that happens once you wake up, right? Right, right. No, no, there, it's lucid dreaming or whatever you would call it. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that's you know, the stuff that I just read from Tinkers or whatever, just that quality of... Um, I, I, I don't know, you know, that, they, I, that this existential, like, you know, we are in these bodies right here, right now, but not only... You know, and so this, yeah. this, the, the sense of, because that's another thing that, uh, you know, um, that I struck by with you, so many of your poems is, again, like the almost the osmosis between like the body and the landscape. There's, it's very, they're very topographical and if you feel like you're feeling over and the, and the, I, when I, I mean, I'm a sucker for pastoral. I write like kind of lyric pastoral. I love landscape. And I know you talk about that when you're, um, work that you do on the temples, the Deccan temples, and the, the pre-modern landscape culture. That you talk about it. Yeah. Um, and, Somebody and, has done quite a bit of research. It sounds well, like fascinating <laughs> stuff to read, which I ask you about that. But but um, but yeah, like that's and I, so I just get that sense too. And when you have your ekphrastic poems too, as you're going yeah. over a painting, um, there's that there's that I all well. When I do well, that, I, my, oh, go ahead. Yeah, like I, I mean, I'm, I want you to actually talk more about ekphrasis and ekphrastic writing because one thing that I was struck by uh, in the excerpt you sent me of the third book is the way you talk about 
the still life, you know, the still life that this character of yours is drawing, you know, the various still lives that you're that this that this character is making. But then the words that describe these still lives are still lives in 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 and of themselves. Um, and uh, so, you know, and and I think I could say that about what I've read um, about the other books as well. The way in which um, you know material things and the material landscape. The environment of 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 these people come alive is is like a crassus at its best. So, so maybe could could you talk about your relationship with a crassus? Yeah, well, partly I just I'm I love paintings. I love to go look at paintings, and I think uh, I have a I I I I just have such an admiration for painters. You know, I, I'll catch myself walking around, and I'll just look at the sky and say do I have even the faintest idea of what color that really is? How, like, I know there are painters, <laughs> like the Hudson Valley painters or whatever, could do that sunset, and I can look at it, and I would have just no idea. what. So, so I don't have facility with color and pigment, but I have some facility with words, and that's some of the joy is trying to see if you can get that visual, you know, if you can convert what would be a visual experience into, a, you know, experience with language. Um, and I'm, and, and in that sense, you have know, ekphrastic kind of you know, art that is about other art, and what happens when you sort of convert that you know art that's in one medium to another, kind of how it transfigures yes. or transforms. But um, it also seems like you're using the the artworks, the fictional artworks, to, to in a sense get into the minds of these of these characters, and then move right. us to other places and other objects, and then come back. That's yeah, that's that's a it's the same. I guess I do the same thing with you know writing about work, other those paintings in that in the new book. Um, as I the, I use it the same way I use landscape, which is it's never just a pretty landscape. It's never just a lyrical. The landscape is always an extension of the character. I that's that osmosis where the the landscape is is is, is the character's mind. It's just another rendering of it in a different medium. I think of like Wallace Stevens poetry, you know, the sort of like this atmospheric kind of this kind of thing. So I think of everything as mind, basically, you know, a, a bare bush with a bunch of birds jumping around in it is like a brain to me with and the birds are like little thoughts. You know, see, <laughs> you know so you know, just just doing that, and the that's a nice vivid image. But then I was also wondering if the if the acrostic writing helps you tell the truth and tell it slant. Like in a sense, like for me, what um, it it's just a way for me to get outside myself because you know it's like, I mean, of course I'm in there, and you know my obsessions are in there. But right. but in a sense, like by talking about a Caravaggio painting or a bunch of Caravaggio paintings. You know, it it's it's like a way of getting at what I want to say, but with with these intermediaries, if you will. Yeah, that it's, I I say this I feel like at every reading or discussion I have, but that kind of thing it puts me in mind of the, you know, the line from one of Auden's poems about um, the truth, like love and sleep resists direct approach, mm. and so that idea that you're using another media, you know, you, it's slightly. Like that, you know, writing about a painting slightly just puts things kind of in, in the periphery in a way where, you know, that writing about the painting or that you might be able to catch things that you might not otherwise um, be, be able to get into language if you're kind of going right, you know, directly after something. Um, yeah, exactly. Because that's something that I guess, you know, we all face as writers is that we have our standard repertoire maybe or like yeah. our our ticks or you know like i i don't know we figured out how to do certain things so so how do we get out of of those modes of, of writing i mean yeah. for me uh, you know looking at paintings looking at uh, things that seem completely removed from uh, or at least you know at first glance seem removed from what i want to directly say is is a is a good tactic yeah 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 and i th so i find that you know finding um subjects or realms that have their own language is um you know so in the the book that you read uh, that i gave you some of the you know six to seven pages from the new book um it's about an island so i've just been doing all sorts of like research about the geology of these islands you know and and not like 
I, I don't, I, there's no geological, there's no geological lessons or anything, but you find like the language of how rocks move and cross cut in the beds and the climbs and the anticlines. And it just, it suddenly you think, well, what would I, you know, if I described clouds with those nouns and verbs, would that open something unexpected, yeah. you know, that would, that would just uh, refresh the, you know, continually refreshing the language and, you know, um, finding new, new words or, or not to say new words, but words that you wouldn't have thought of in a different, you know, outside of a habitual context. Right, like a new lexicon, like a new, yeah. Um, yeah, and and both like new words, but also I find like new syntax as well. So, mm -hmm. for instance, yeah. I was reading the translation of uh, the 17th century uh, Indian emperor, and you know, mm -hmm. like these kinds of archaisms that he used, you know, are like this kind of very floral language, but you know, like used judiciously or used like uh, when you know in a certain kind of poem. It, it, it works, it uh, yeah. adds texture to, to the writing, yeah. So yeah. has research been, that kind of research, been important to all the books? I guess it's funny, I, you know, um, um, the first novel I ever tried to write was just, it was so impossibly like a research novel that it turned me off. So I, <laughs> I went and wrote Tinkers because I thought I don't have to do any research because Tinkers is just, I have the landscape and the voices and everything right at the tips of my fingers. I, I, the way I research is just, it's very sort of not opportunistic, but it's just very off the cuff. You know, I'll be writing and I'll say, oh, what is that kind of a boat called? And I'll just Google it. <laughs> and then I'll go down the rabbit hole and find <laughs> all this other crazy stuff. Um, but what about but, like the medical stuff in Tinkers? You know, like this guy who's, you know, who's who's dying and he's hallucinating and all these things are happening to his body. Like, don't you have to kind of... Uh, well, the story with, I mean, in this... Um, uh, and that your poems are make me think of that too. You know, just if you've been with a person who's you know um, leaving their more mortal career, as it were. You know, it's it's very so. I, I, um, so I've I've attended deathbeds. You know, I've been I've been present. Well, you know, um, but in the case of Tinker, you know, one of the characters has epilepsy, which is something I never would have written about because it's you know it's so much kind of stuff around you know seizures and just you know that sort of thing. But one of the things I just realized with, with the death is I just, I, I, I thought about the experience of death rather than death objectively, you know, so as opposed to doing research about what, what, what happens, I was thinking, what is it like for the character? So then, for example, in Tinker is the, one of the, the characters sort of going in and out of consciousness. So he thinks of it as if it's his face is going just under the surface of water and then he surfaces. And I just use that as kind of the controlling metaphor because who's going to begrudge somebody their own experience <laughs> and their own metaphors for you know, the character who has epilepsy thinks of it as being like being struck by lightning, you know, so you right. can't, you can't, begrudge, you know, that, that, that sort of, so yeah, I don't do research that, that much. Um, I mean, I'm always like looking up cool words, like, you know, trying to find stuff, but, um, but I think this, yeah, the, just the same, th that same, like the quality in your poems is like moving line by line. I feel like I'm, I, that they're, they're very phenomenological to me. They're very experiential. It's, it's, I don't feel like I'm being shown something. I feel like I'm actually going over the topography of the lines and the Oh, I'm glad to hear that. I mean, that was the intention, but one doesn't know, you know, the impact they have on the reader or the listener and how they experience the poem. And, and I think that maybe the way I think about um, art history and architectural history is similar in the sense that I want to give the reader a sense of what it feels like to move through these buildings, to move around these buildings, to move through these landscapes, and then to make an argument based on that kind of yeah, phenomenological and experiential experience. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> experience. No, 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 yeah. No, that's, yeah, what know, other short is there? Yeah, that's, <laughs> <laughs> no, but that's yeah. that's yeah. what I like about the, st the stuff that I read about you know, the, the way that you talk about the temples and just the way so much is they're just sort of looked at from the outside and they're yeah. seen as sort of derivative and imitative. Um, but then the way that you Essentially, it's you know, it's it's you, you imagine yourself, you it's you yeah. integrate your point of view into the landscape and into the people what it would be like to be among those things and all the water that they're you know. So, yeah, yeah, 
Yeah, I mean, I'm trying to recreate period experience and make uh, an argument about these temples from my imagination of period experience. Let's see what, uh, when the book comes out next year, what, what the other scholars think about this approach. <laughs> but, but, but it also reminds me about uh, something you said, you know, you, about fiction, that fiction is imminence. I love that because I, it made me think again, and I was going, and my immediate reaction as well, history is imminence. You know, the best history writing is about kind of imminence and about, um, you know, yeah, like about this, this is a specific time and place. And if we can get at kind of the sensory experience of that time and place, I think, um, you know, that history would be, would be more convincing, more compelling. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. There's, a, there's, a, there's the danger of the drift into abstraction. Um, as a, and, and, the, and I, I actually had that, you know, writing, writing tinkers, I thought, geez, you know, the plot is, <laughs> this guy's in bed. And he's trying to imagine his dad and then he dies. Like, wow, the, the pitch meeting for that would be, but <laughs> it, it, it was so, it could so easily just turn into just philosophical, you know, existential yeah. kind of stuff. I just decided that it had to be imminent. Every single, I imagine the reader taking the book and being able to fan through it and put her finger down anywhere and would, she would find a concrete noun or verb, nothing abstract. Absolutely. You know, and totally also, but but you're also sort of going back and forth between the two stories, right? The guy who's mm -hmm. in bed and his father. Yeah. And then I assume you you have a chance to bring in a like a longer arc and also more action because of the father. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. 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 And that's the yeah. And so the, the, to me the you know the leap of faith that I took as a writer is just not just not trying to go for meaning with a capital M or symbol with a capital S. Just just it, those things will attend to themselves if you are paying the best and closest sustained attention you can to just precision of description. No explanation. I don't presume to understand anything. I'm just describing in as lucid prose as I possibly can. And then lo and behold, you go back and I find all sorts of stuff that the language is doing that I could yeah. ne I'd never be intellectually sophisticated enough to think it up ahead of time and deploy it. Yeah, yeah. So um, I also loved what you said in this email about um, fiction writers don't always take care of the words, though I don't think that could be said about you. <laughs> so um, how do you like, you know, how do you push students to take care of the words, for instance? Oh, well, you know, it's funny because right now we, I, I teach a workshop, a writing workshop on Monday nights. And so it's usually from six to nine. So we started today at 5.30. Yeah. We broke at 6.45 and we're going to reconvene at eight. <laughs> so we're in the middle of my <laughs> workshop. This is the, um, so, um, so for any of the students who are watching, I, I just, I just push on the language all the time. And, you know, and I, and I, I, I think they they appreciate and I always appreciate just and it can be intimidating at first, but the degree of specificity, you know, that you can get and, and what it means to write sentences that mean what they say and say what they mean, you know, sort of often yeah. going on about like, you don't want the reader to have to just say, okay, I get it. I, I get what you, I get it. It's a, a, like, it, you want it to be right there in all that immediacy, you know? Yeah, you know? yeah. So, so one thing I want to, Ask you about very quick, and then here's else we can nope. take. Yes, is, yes. Is um, for, to what extent is uh, you know, and again, like this revision and all that sort of stuff. But I'm always, you know, poems always remind me of songs, and I was a drummer in a former life, so not a musician. That's right. Drummer. I read that. Yeah, yeah. Yes, um, yes. The guy who follows the band around from town to town. But um, um, I'm just wondering how much um, uh, of the process of you know, like bringing a poem down to the page is improvisational. I don't know if it's improvisational, but sound is extremely important. I read and read and like I read them out loud. Uh, and even in, in trying to, uh, you know, just to prepare for this reading, I read some of the poems and realized, oh, you know, that just doesn't work when, when read out loud. And so I, you know, I, I cut out lines or I was kind of, you know, like breaking the lines differently. And I yeah. do that with the prose as well. Um, yeah. You know, even for art history essays that I'm writing or talks that I'm giving, I'm always reading out loud because, 
you know, th that's when you catch the clunky stuff, the the yeah. less true stuff, the 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 awkward constructions, yeah. uh, and then just revising endlessly. I think is is what I do. And I I wanted to ask you about revision as well, but I don't know if we have time. <laughs> endless as well. I've come endless to think of endless as well. Yeah. I've I've come to think of what we usually commonly term as revision. It's not revision. It's what writing is. Right. You know, right. it's just this iterative thing that you just keep going over and trying to make it better and more and more precise. Yeah, so. and just like sculpted because that's the sense I had of of your lines that they're sculpted and mm -hmm. and lyrical. So. Yeah. I have an audience question. Oh. About <laughs> sure. about the about the absence having its own very resonant presence both of both of you are pointing to. Is it only a conjuring or because the people were part of your body? To you, do, I think it's. Do you have a sense of what they have a materiality now through you? Should I repeat that? I think it's such a great question. I don't know that I can answer it, but it's nice to have it out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, because and again, these are the things that I'm. That's the kind of question that I feel. Um, Privileged to ponder, if never to answer definitively or to solve. You know, I feel different differently. Those are the questions that it always bears to continually refresh and renew your thinking by reposing them. Um, um, because I think, in some ways, you do. Like I'm sure the brain, the literally the literal literal arrangement of the neurons and the cells in my brain are shaped by not only the, the presence of people, but th their absence and the way that my brain arranges itself around those absences. I think mean, it's very physiological sort of, you know, it's, but it's also very experiential to me. It's much, you know, it's, um, I still feel those people's presence. I can still like smell them and just remember what it's like to be with them. And just, you know, very, just very, very, you know, there's a palpable um, sense of them. But the presence and the absence changes, though, because right. I mean, at least for me, the the palpability of the person, you know, like you know, like days after, or six months yeah. after, or one year after, versus ten years after, there is a change in their materiality. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah. I have another question. How do you achieve great description without a torrent of adjectives that do more harm than good? Ooh, who is this for? This must be for Paul. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Um, now that makes me want to go back and look at my prose and say, maybe I don't. Maybe I just load adjectives up. I'm not afraid of adjectives. I love adverbs. It's just just making sure that they're not merely doing triage, triage on inadequate, neutral, watery verbs and nouns, you know. Um, but I'm kind of, I believe in more is more. So I, don't, I like to load up the language. See, see, I'm, that's just one of the things I just happen to be like, it's just a matter of taste. I'm personally interested in how much meaning you can get into a single sentence. You know? I, I think I, I, I'm on the opposite end of the spectrum. I, I mean, as it is, the poems are small and then I'll cut <laughs> even more. So I'll just yeah, keep yeah, yeah. cutting, cutting, cutting. And yeah. Uh, yeah, so then sometimes I try to make myself write more, but then I still end up cutting. So I, yeah, um, I mean, I'm not opposed to adjectives or adverbs or more, but I think I'm, I'm, I lean towards the spare. Yeah, and I think it's also what you're describing, you know, what is it that you're trying to describe? Because a lot of times, and again, that's just that, just habituating yourself to sustain very close, close attention, because often you'll find that description doesn't, it, it is, is not necessarily heavy on adjectives. It's heavier on nouns, concrete mm -hmm. nouns. And, and and I agree with what you said. It's it, it it has to do with what you are trying to convey. It has to do with the kind of the experience, the sense experience, the emotional experience that you're trying to convey. And so with the second book, I feel that maybe I have to do more with space, with line breaks, and also with rhythm and with repetition and at the kind of obsessive repetition which you heard in the book. In, yeah. in no more, like the body, the body, the body, the body, and then break, and then you say something else. So I, I just like with that subject matter, I, you know, I don't, or at least, you know, I'm not the poet for it because I mean, in the sense like, like I, 
the way that I've found is to do it through rhythm and through repetition and through a kind of spareness. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. What are the grounds where poetry and prose meet? <laughs> Who's asking these questions? <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm not the um, I think that's, um, oh, go, go I, ahead. Well, I think the precision of description, the truth to description and the imaginative truth, I think, I'm stealing from um, something that Paul said in one, one of his short essays, um, I think, I think the best poet, the best poets and prose writers are, are I think, doing the same thing, if I may say so. Yeah. Um, I've been uh, thinking about this and thinking about it with my students too, just as write, you know, just thinking we're artists, you know, and sometimes those distinctions are not as productive or meaningful for the artist to be thinking about. You know, it's, you know, um, it can be, it's interesting at what point does a prose poem turn into lyric prose or you know, whatever just as it flips yeah, over. Yeah. But when you're writing, I was gonna say to my you know, students, your jo our job is to make works of art that succeed on their own terms, you know, and that they have a certain integrity and that if I feel like I've achieved that, I feel like let the marketing department name it. You know, I don't care if you call it a hot fudge Sunday. I just don't care, it's a, it works on its own. Um, genre sometimes is sometimes is you know it's a term or a label given to something after it has been produced by someone other than the person who produced it. For convenience Very sake, well it's fun. Put. It's you know sometimes you got to write the course catalog, right? You know you got to write the book, you know the, the you know the the, you know, the, the, the blurb the for the book, or exactly, or, yeah, or decide right, which right. shelf it's going to be on. Like, is, right, is right. it going to be with you know Wallace Stevens, or is it going to be with uh, you know? Can't even yeah. think of a prose writer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's, a, you know, but when at least in our role, like when we're, you know, doing what we're doing as artists, as writers, I don't, I don't really think about it. What book have you read that you wish you had written? Well, I can go first. Um, so I've been really, uh, moved by and taken by the Ramayana, which is a, a, a Sanskrit epic from ancient India. So I wouldn't presume to say I wish I had written the Ramayana because many poets uh, worked on this and you know it, it changed over centuries and uh, people wrote and rewrote the Ramayana in many languages. They've, um, you know, it, it like you can see it produced in dance and in various media, but I do wish I, I had written a, a full-length poetry collection that that kind of tells the the Ramayana in in verse uh, in in contemporary English. Uh, you know, I've written some Ramayana poems, but I've not written like an entire Ramayana, and I wish I had done that. My usual my usual answer is I wish I wrote Moby Dick. <laughs> um, or the book of Genesis. Moses has been my favorite author lately. He's pretty good. Um, Think that or or anything by Marilyn Robinson. I wish I could have written, you know, something something like that. Mm -hmm. um, but that's to me that's part of the. It's you know, I don't think of it as the anxiety of influence. I think it is the privilege of influence. Trying to make sense is as good as she did, as, good as Moses did, as good as Shakespeare did. You know, best of luck. But you know, that's that's half the joy of and the privilege of you know, trying trying to write like the people that you admire most. Well, our time is just about up, and I know Paul has a class to get back to, but I want to thank you both for a wonderful conversation that I'm so glad is being recorded so we can go back and visit it again. Um, thank you both. I really oh, do thank appreciate you, it. It's been, it's been wonderful. And thank you, Roger, yes. for putting this together. It enriches yes, us. Thank you, Roger. Every single week we get a chance to be together. So I'll say goodbye to you both for now. And know that we have the books from both of them at the button below, so don't miss it. Um, I'd like to thank you for joining us. It has been a pleasure being here tonight. And uh, uh, coming up on Right America is uh, this Thursday is quite a treat. We have 
Norman Lear with Roger Rosenblatt. Excuse me, this Wednesday, day after tomorrow, is Roger Rosenblatt and Norman Lear. And we get to talk. Uh, well, they'll talk about whatever they want to, but I just want to listen in. I just can't wait for this one. And then a week from tonight, we have three authors, Nick Flynn, Pablo Medina, and Gail Mazur. And Bright America keeps continuing on Monday night at 7 o'clock. And don't miss it. Come back. It's been a great time being here. And thank you to both of our authors. And thank you to Roger once again for putting together such a remarkable series. Enjoy your evening. <laughs>